Hey guys, my name is Mac and welcome to Simple Biology. In the next three videos, we're going to be talking about photosynthesis. Now, photosynthesis plays, the, uh, plays a role as the foundation for life as we know it. What photosynthesis does is it allows certain organisms to convert the energy given off by the sun in the form of light into a usable form of energy, chemical energy, in the form of various uh, sugars and other molecules that can be used by different organisms. And so without photosynthesis, the organisms that can't do photosynthesis would simply just die off because they wouldn't have any form of usable energy. And so that's why photosynthesis is important to life. Now before we really get into how photosynthesis works, it's important to know the nature of light. Now light is often called electromagnetic, electromagnetic radiation. In other words, it's waves that travel through electric and magnetic fields. You don't really need to know how that works, just know that it uh, is called that. Now, light is often described in terms of the electromagnetic spectrum, or EMS. And the important thing to know is that the, the EMS, or electromagnetic spectrum, is, extends far beyond just visible light. Probably you're most familiar with visible light, which is just this little sliver right here. That's the red light, the orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet light, often um, known by the acronym Roy G. Biv. But light is far more than just the visible light. That's not all you can see, but on the red side, you have infrared light, microwave, uh, microwaves, and radio waves. And on the violet side, you have ultraviolet light, x-ray waves, and gamma radiation. All of these have different characteristics, and uh, the, the most important thing you have to know for us is where the energy lies. Now, a photon is a packet of energy uh, and it can be thought of as just the unit of light. And so the energy of this photon, or packet of energy, is directly related to its frequency. Now frequency is highest over in this, in this gamma uh, area, and so the energy is also highest over here, and lowest over here on the, in the radio side. Now the opposite of frequency would be wavelength. Now when wavelength is, is long, when you have a long wavelength like radio waves, um, you're going to have a low energy and a low frequency. On the other hand, when you have a short wavelength, you're going to have a high frequency and a high energy, like gamma, ra a gamma radiation. So uh, frequency and wavelength are inversely related, and energy and frequency are directly related. That'll be important to know. Now when you look at pigments, pigments are um, different chemicals and compounds that absorb certain wavelengths over other wavelengths. When you have these pigments, such as the ones that are involved in photosynthesis, they have a very characteristic absorption spectra. And so this absorption spectra shows how much light is absorbed at each wavelength. So you can kind of see these. Uh, these three are chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, and carotenoids. And these are the three types of, uh, of pigments that are going to be used in photosynthesis. And like I said, each has its own absorption spectra. So you can kind of see that at different wavelengths, each will be more effective than other or less effective than others. And so that'll be important to know. The interesting thing is that uh, the action spectra of photosynthesis and an action spectra uh, shows how well, or an action spectrum shows how well a process works at each wavelength. The action spectrum for photosynthesis uh, actually is very similar to the absorption spectra of the three pigments that are involved in photosynthesis. The reason for this is that as, um, as these pigments absorb light, that's the same light that they're converting into the energy that can be used in photosynthesis. So when, um, when you have more of this energy absorbed, photosynthesis is going to work faster and it's going to produce, produce more of those sugars that it's outputting. And so that's kind of interesting to know. The next thing we're going to look at is the anatomy of a chloroplast, how it's structured, and uh, just the different parts of a chloroplast. Now, as we've discussed before, a chloroplast is the organelle where photosynthesis occurs. It's actually one of the few organelles that has a double membrane, meaning it has um, it doesn't just have the the one double layer of phospholipids; it has two whole separate membranes. And this uh, this is actually because of its evolutionary origin. Um, which we'll get into later on. Inside of those membranes is a region called the stroma. And now the stroma is just, like I said, the region inside those double membranes 
and outside of these membranes that are inside of the chloroplast. Even farther down, you have these membrane sacs called thylakoids. And uh, the, these thylakoids are all connected into, uh, by different regions of membrane, uh, but they're arranged into kind of different compartments, which allows photosynthesis to occur correctly. These thylakoids are also arranged in different stacks called grana, or the singular being, being one grana. The area inside of these uh, grana or thyl and thylakoids is called the thylakoid space. And having the two uh, spaces, thylakoid space and the stroma, allows photosynthesis to be separated and to uh, occur in the right manner. And so that's very important to know. Now we're going to close this video with a brief overview of how photosynthesis works and the different phases involved in it. Now there are two parts to photosynthesis, the light reactions and the Calvin cycle, which are also, kn also known as the light dependent reactions and the light independent reactions because of when light is necessary and where it's not. Now the light reactions, as the name suggests, use light, and light it provides the energy that fuels them and allows them to occur. What they do is they take ADP uh, and convert it to ATP. They also can uh, use NADP plus and water to produce NADPH and oxygen. Basically, they take the hydrogens out of the water and attach them to the NADP plus along with two electrons. Thus, NADP plus is known as an electron acceptor. This whole process um, adds energy to the ADP to, be, to make it ATP. Mm -hmm and adds energy to NADP plus to make it NADPH. And both of these will later be used in the Calvin cycle. Uh, lastly, the light reactions occur on the thylakoid membranes and uh, these, these, different, um, these different products go into different places, but it's important to know that they occur on the thylakoid membranes. Now the other uh, part of photosynthesis is what's called the Calvin cycle. Now it uses the ATP and NADPH that was produced in the white reactions to create sugars, to manufacture sugars uh, and use carbon dioxide in order to make more sugars. This uh, process occurs in the stroma, in that little space uh, between uh, two of the membranes of the chloroplast, which is, again, that's important to know uh, in, when we talk about photosynthesis. And now you can kind of see why those membranes are in place because they allow the two different parts of photosynthesis to be separated and compartmentalized in order to be most efficient. And so that's really it for now. We'll be going to photosynthesis more in our next video, but uh, as far as background goes, it's as simple as that.